Hi guys and welcome back to VR Essentials where we talk about the practical uses of virtual reality. Today, very exciting video in our season one, episode three of the Meta Business Podcast. We can learn all the ins and outs and also the business aspect of the metaverse. We speak to Pedro, who's the product manager and also Kako, the creative director of Avery, one of the leading studios who has come up with some really awesome titles, including Pixel Ripped and Yuki. Now in last week's episode, we spoke to the leading founder and lead developer of Walkabout, Mini and the week before that, we spoke to Clues Interactive, who released one of the most popular VR fitness games called Synth Riders. Now, there are some timestamps below, of course, so do skip to wherever you want to go. And if you're listening from our website on Spotify, then of course, welcome to you also. All right, without further ado, let's roll the tape. So how, how did you guys um, meet? Yeah, I, was working, I was working at Armory uh, before Kako, so uh, I met him when he was hired. <laughs> Okay, the, the proper name, the proper way to say your company's name is? Arvori. Arvori, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Arvori is based where exactly? São Paulo. São Paulo, São Paulo so that's Brazil. that's Brazil, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Awesome. And well, are there a lot of studios in Brazil? Is gaming something that's really popular over there? A lot of uh, gaming studios over there? Should I move there if I wanted to work <laughs> in gaming? I wouldn't say many. Yeah, I wouldn't say many. We have plenty of uh, we have plenty of uh, free to play mobile startups over here. Uh, when I say plenty, is like four big ones, something like that. Right. Uh, like four or five big ones, and we have some independent studios, but it's not really like a big industry. You know, most independent studios, uh, except I mean, there's Arvory. Uh, which is uh, like it's also a startup, but we are not. Mm -hmm. we, we work with VR games. Um, there is like here and there, as anywhere else in the world, there are uh, independent groups of people making games. Usually, uh, some of them depend on, on government funding. Uh, I don't know how to say that in, in, in English. No, I understand. It's, it's very, very clear. It's like it's a, a, government, a grant. Government. Yeah, yeah, probably yeah. a grant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, um, but overall, uh, there are like I think some uh, Brazil has is is very big, but there are a few states that have sure. around uh, like from from five to ten. So it's uh, a little bit like the Silicon Valley of startup people who want to get into mobile gaming. Is it sounds like what you're trying to so yeah, a lot of little not people really not many big lot, people but a lot of little yeah, people it's, yeah more more little companies we have cool. we have uh, like two or three companies that have more than 100 employees i don't awesome. know how many mm -hmm. do, do you know when avri was was founded do you remember four years ago i think okay probably four years ago right yeah cool. something like I, I'm, that. I'm doing four year anniversary yeah wow. you are for, cool. for avri so uh, when I joined, I think it existed for for uh, a few months. So I think mm -hmm. it's probably the company is doing like four months or oh, sorry, four years, four years and a half. Cool. And uh, Pe Pedro, just to ask you again: when when did you start to to get into uh, developing and programming? Um, well, I I did. Uh, design... Give us a backstory as to how you got into okay, it. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm gonna try to be quick. Um, <laughs> Under a minute, we have yeah, one we minute. Have all, we have all the time okay. in the world. Don't we have one so minute. Can talk about how much? All right, you want. so I'm I, I'm going to do since you're so one day I was born. Here, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> and I have to start from the beginning. When I was a kid, <laughs> um, <laughs> I I really to wanted take to. Take all night. <laughs> okay, go go. I really for wanted it. to to be a, a game designer. I, I mean, I I played games. I knew there are people who made games, but I, I didn't really realistically for a long time in my life think that I would make games. Uh, it was kind of like when you ask a child what they want to be, and they say it's an ast. I want to be an astronaut. It's like, okay, I believe you want to do that, but the chances that you're actually going to, to do that with your life are very small. Um, so for a long time, I, I pursued a, a graphic designer career. and So a lot I of Illustrator did, uh, and Photoshop. 
Yes, yes. Actually, the 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 major was like more general general design. So we did okay. product design. We did like many different things. We did like bus stops. We designed uh, like children's toys. Things that are very wow. Diverse, okay. Uh, so no, like, non interactive stuff and uh, not web design. Yeah, as well. Was that but also as some well, okay. interactive stuff. But most of the most of the of what I did in college was learning like general design methodology. Okay. And during this this period that we were uh, studying design, uh, I gathered uh, some, some friends who were interested in game design to start creating a study group. And we were we we created something like every week we would go to some somebody's home and talk about some discuss some subject about game design. Um and after doing that for many months, maybe one full year, we started thinking, hey, we all, all like game design. We, we all uh, know how to do stuff. Why don't we make a game? Cool. And then we created this independent group um, and started participating of game jams and stuff. Eventually, eventually I got hired in a free-to-play company called Taps. I don't know. I'm probably I shouldn't be, be talking too much about other companies. Where, where no, but you can say where, where, how, how you got to where you are today. So it's <laughs> yeah, no, no yeah. problem about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's part of your so, journey. It's part of your journey. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. So I started working with free-to-play games. Uh, I worked for almost five years, which makes me think that I'm almost reaching the, the same... Uh, uh, I'm working with VR for almost as long as I ha had worked with mobile games before. Mm -hmm. So I worked with mo mobile games for for, for uh, almost five years, and now uh, I went to Agri and I'm working with VR games for uh, four years now. And I, I just want to ask you, uh, what what languages did you learn for gaming, and how did you learn them? Did you learn them at college? Did you learn them on the job? Uh, because well, it's pretty tough um, to learn how to program stuff for, for games. Well, I, mean. I, I am a game designer, so uh, I, I do program. I do program in uh, Java and C Sharp, but uh, mostly it was because I wanted to, to prototype stuff as a game designer and I needed tools for that. So I learned uh, the proper tools to be able to convey my ideas to other people. So uh, did, did but, but did you learn on the job? Was after you were employed, or or did you manage to yeah, learn uh, before? Yeah, I, it was mostly on the job actually. Uh, C right. sharp because in Arvori we, we use Unity, and uh, when I when I joined Arvori I was I wasn't actually uh, very very familiar with Unity, so right. I used it like all my free time to catch up with the other people who were who were already familiar with it. Right, and now I'm. It's by far the the two my my two of choice. I I'm, I I feel I'm I'm. Uh, um, how how long did it take you to proficiently? <laughs> proficiently. How long did how long did it take you to feel um, comfortable with it? Uh, probably something between uh, a few months and one year. Um, wow. Okay. Because. Of course, I don't do. Uh, uh, I am not. I am, uh, again. I'm not a programmer. I work as a, as a game designer. So right, but, but I don't I mean, have to program most of the time. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so, so before I get to Kako, because I will come to you, Kako. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what what's the biggest difference between a game designer and a programmer for those who are uh, perhaps a little bit unsure in that case? So, um, a game designer is a person who will think of the all gameplay elements. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, how do the mechanics work? How do the, the rules of the game works? How do the objectives of the, what the objectives of the game will be? Uh, and if you go a little more specific in uh, particular gameplay areas, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, in particular game game design areas. You will see level designers, economy designers, narrative designers, uh, people who will think of specific parts of the game, right. and always having in mind what the player experience uh, is intended to be. 
So when I have to, to describe what a game designer is, uh, it's some, someone who understands what you want the player to feel. Uh, so for example, I'm going to make a, I want to make a game that will make the player feel satisfied for completing a collection of monsters, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, something like Pokemon. And then we'll um, prototype and figure out what elements you need to, to create that kind of experience through mechanics. And uh, yep. not necessarily a game designer needs to program because then, and then uh, here comes the, the programmer, right? The, the, the programmer yep. is the person who actually knows how to code and how to implement uh, those ideas. We, we believe firmly in, in Arvui that everyone works as a game designer in the team. And for, for me, it's something very important. So even a person who is hired as a programmer and will program the game, they also take part of the ideation and to understand what we want with the game and always uh, suggesting and trying out new stuff. Uh, so everyone acts uh, as a game designer, but if you are mm -hmm. like a, a higher game designer, your responsibility is to make sure that uh, the the mechanics that we are choosing to the game are the the mechanics that will uh, produce that that emotional experience in the player. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So Keko, we'd love to hear your story. How how did you get into uh, VR gaming? What what was your path? From uh, a background of art. Uh, an art background. Um, um, I started actually in the mu movie business in the 90s. In the cool. 90s. Um, but it was ad advertising and I was mm -hmm. not sure about that. I knew I wanted to do something related with art. Maybe what, what were you doing? What was your role exactly on on these ads? Well, I was uh, I was a baby. Like I was like a, a pro I worked as a, a uh, production trainee. Okay. I started out as a production trainee, and then I got to the uh, camera department. I was a video assist for a long time, and when I was on my way to be a second assistant camera, I decided to drop and start and go to fine art college. Right. So I I I stayed on college for about two or three years, and then I dropped college to study graphic graphic design mm -hmm. and teach comic comic books how to how to draw and how to tell stories well wow, nice and then um i started working as an illustrator and graphic designer and that was about 25 years later <laughs> <laughs> i was um i was I, I was not connected anymore with my work I was looking for, for um, something else, so I started. I, I went back to advertising movies as a director, um, but it was also not that. And then a friend of of mine introduced me to Laganaro, um, who is the the line's creative director, and. I started working for Ivory as a freelancer, as a graphic designer freelancer, doing the Pixel Reaper 95 pitch. Which um, we will be talking about very soon. Yeah. And one month later, they, they offered me a, 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 a position of production designer, um, which I said, okay, let's do it. And it was late 2018 I, I believe and that's it that's that's my short version story awesome so um, you guys are both not from the VR uh, history space because of course VR is still very new yeah. at what point uh, did you both get introduced to VR and knew that it was something that you wanted to to be part of or whether it was just an accident and you just happened to be part of it and then now of course uh whether you want to continue or whether it's not something you feel is 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 for you although i know it's probably is for you mm -hmm. Petra, you can start first okay um i my first contact with vr was actually before i was at arvuri 
because the the company that I was working at, the the mobile game company, they actually have a VR division. They do have until uh, today. And my first contact with uh, uh, back then it was mostly Vive. We I remember the day we we installed the base stations in the office and. Uh, everyone was like making a line to try games, and one of the first games that I played was actually, uh, you know, the lab that came with uh, yep. in VR, and they so, had a mini so game. Pretty. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and they had a mini game called Sortex, which was a bullet hell game where you would mm -hmm. use your mm -hmm. hands pretty much like Yuki. Yeah, and when I played that, I had the, the realization that VR had the. Sometimes people don't see VR as as something as big in the history of gaming, but I I realized that VR had the potential of being as big as how we transitioned from 2D to 3D games. You know, back when you played uh, SNES. Mario, and then right. we went to Mario 64, and the gameplay changed com completely, and the yeah. world, the, the way that we designed the worlds had to change completely, because we were making mm -hmm. an exploration-based game. Like, every aspect of the, the, the games had to be completely re re rethought right. to, right. to even, even in defined genres, like mm -hmm. platforming or exploration, like Zelda, mm -hmm. and like, the mechanics... Would the, the the same mechanics that applied in 2D didn't apply to 3D, and I think VR right now is a, is still crawling. Uh, the VR industry is still crawling, even though uh, there are many people who many more people who own a VR device now, especially when the the Quest and then the mm -hmm. Quest Two got released. Mm -hmm. But I think the VR VR, uh, VR industry still hasn't realized uh, how much potential the VR has uh, for right. Uh, for the future, yes. For for actually being a media that can't be translated to to anything else, and I think mm -hmm. Yuki specifically is 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 an attempt of of doing that uh, with at, at least in the part of the the, the bullet hell experience. Um, it's hard to find a game that you a VR game that you see and you think oh um, like usually when you see a VR game you think uh, this is cool because it's like Zelda in VR or because it's right. like uh, Doom in VR because it's like uh, X in VR and uh, Yuki is something that you can't, of course we based a lot on, on bullet hell and roguelike games which exist in, in other media, mm -hmm. but the bullet hell mechanics uh, the way that they work in Yuki, they wouldn't be able to be ported it, it would be completely impossible to port Yuki to a flat screen. Right. You wouldn't be able to control, to understand, to have the spatial awareness about Yuki. We, we use a lot of volume, we use a lot of uh, three-dimensionality, we use all the axes, and we use the rotation. Uh, so you you wouldn't be able to think, oh, okay, let's try to, to, to release Yuki for, I don't know, Nintendo Switch. It wouldn't happen. You can right. do that, that with many, many VR titles if you wanted to, even if you had to, to adapt some, some things like, oh, okay, Amy won't, be, won't work the same way, so you have to adapt. But uh, the level design in Yuki is completely incompatible with uh, with uh, traditional a way of game. Right, yeah. flat screen game, yeah. And, 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 and for me, uh, this is a, actually a, a great sign that we are doing it right because that we are actually... Uh, trying to, to, to push further what the medium can do. Because and, uh, Gecko, you, you're working, uh, you said creative director, is that right? Yeah. So how challenging is it for a creative director who's used to more traditional forms of art or uh, coming from an advertising film background to be put in an environment where you have to think uh, completely in an immersive kind of, kind of way when you developed uh, when you worked on the various different uh, projects like Yuki or uh, Pixel Ripped? Yeah, I have uh, a couple of... Uh, the biggest challenges for me were... Um, first, I never worked with games before. 
this is a new, oh, wow, okay. a new uh, right. um, um, field for me. Uh, and VR is uh, um, something else that, as Pedro was saying, you have to consider the player m much more than any other kind of um, interactive gaming. Right. Um, I mean that, um, to me, um, not only I work as a creative, di a creative director, but also I work as a production designer, which means that I, my approach to uh, VR comes from art and mm -hmm. the, the environmental storytelling and what the player will, how the player will react with the environment. So this, is, this was what, um, something that I had to learn very fast, uh, especially when Arvri chose me as the creative director. And how, um, did, you, how did you adapt? What, what kind of stuff did you do to, uh, to feel more comfortable? Well, um, a lot of study, of course. Um, I think the more you are connected with other um, um, experience, the better. So what, um, what kind of VR experiences did you try that oh, uh, helped you everything, to? Everything, everything, everything. Because right. there's something that is the, the gaming, the, like mm -hmm. how, how Pedro approaches the experience. Um, I I I always look um, also to festivals. I really love VR festivals because right. um, there are ways um, that other creators um, uh, show and mm -hmm. experience that are more um, audacious. Let's you say. You mean like the, like the ones in uh, VR chat with Jean Michel Jean or? Lost Horizon yeah, in of, Sensor. Yeah, the, 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 the ones uh, uh, that are shown in Venice, in Cannes, in Tribeca, and right. new images. Um, there are certain um, approaches that they have that you have mm -hmm. to consider because uh, we always talk about, uh, talk, talks about scale uh, very much. The first time I went to Venice uh, in t uh, 2019, I was like amazed. It was the first time I, I really... Um, um, approach it uh, like experience and said oh okay this is this is all about scale are you um, talking about the vr chat experience or the real event like you actually went to venice the, no no yeah i went i really went to venice okay uh, before covid uh, uh but yeah but i'm talking uh, the the vr experience you're talking how about the, the, VR, they, the, yeah, VR the vr chat experience. experience yeah i think it's VR, vr chat right no 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 not, it's not another experience oh. No, 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 no. Uh, I mean, the actual experiences oh, the um, actual experience. shown okay. uh, at Venice. Okay. Um, and because the, uh, I think the approach that they have mm -hmm. are more experimental. Right. And this is what attracts me. And uh, everything that has to, to do with the what if, mm -hmm. um, I, I, really, I really like. And I remember when I, I first... Um, uh, when Ricardo, our CEO, uh, he, he took me to a, uh, a, an event here in Sao Paulo. It was the first time I, I put a, a headset. Mm -hmm. And I watched it. Um, I think it was Battle Scar. I, I, I don't know if, you, you, if you've seen Battle Scar. Yeah. It was uh, an amazing experience for me that never had any experience with VR. And there's so much... Uh, so uh, this, the environmental storytelling is so deep that it changed me the way how I previously approached the storytelling. Right. Um, so whenever you are inside experience, you have to think mm -hmm. about, okay, is, is the player part of your experience? And I say yes, because he's, it's different from a flat screen or a mobile. You really have the player inside your um, experience, you have to consider that. So this is, I think, is th this challenge of changing your mindset and consider the player as much more uh, part of your uh, of your work mm -hmm. as other other media's that I worked before. So you both worked on uh, the Pixel Rip series, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, Pedro more than I. So but yeah. 
So do you guys, uh, do you, I mean, since you work in a company, it's a little bit different than an indie dev, which I think is really fascinating to uh, find out a little bit more info about is how, how do these, pro do they, do you just get, okay, does the boss come in and go, right guys, we're going to be doing this this month. Uh, no, no, no. We need we need some ideas, or do you or do they call you in and say, "All right, guys, we want to make a new game. We're not quite sure what to do. Uh, let's think of something together." How, how does it work? How did Pixel Rip come about and Yuki well, come about? <laughs> well, I think uh, Pedro can explain more uh, better than I the the Pixel Rip. Oh, really? oh, okay. It's uh, in the case of, of Pixel Rip, I think uh, because Anna is the the Anna Ribeiro is. Uh, is the the create the creative director of Pixar? She's the creator of the of the series, and she already worked on the series before joining Avery. We actually mm -hmm. uh, uh, brought her to the company so we could help her finish the game and, and develop the series together. Oh, you and mean she was already doing the game on her own? Yeah, the, and yeah. then it got brought into yeah, the, the first one. Yeah, and then yeah. the company bought the rights or whatever, and or decided to do it for whatever reason. And and then it, it it continued from there. Yeah, uh, she was developing the, the first installment of the series, uh, which is Pixar Ripper 1989. Mm -hmm. uh, she was developing for I think three or four years before right. uh, before we we did this this agreement of of, of working of developing on it. the game together. Yeah, right. Um, and when she she joined the company, we worked on Pixar Ripper in '94 for. For about one one year or, or something, we released it, and Pixar Rips always came with the promise of be becoming an episodic series about the history of video games. So, right, even when Pixar Rip at eighty nine was released, everyone already knew that we were doing the the next game because when mm -hmm. you finish the, the first one, it teases uh, that we are going to make a full series out of it. So, uh, it was natural. We finished eighty nine, and we went straight to, to prototyping ideas of what 1995 could be about. I have to and say that for the Pixar Rift series, sorry to interrupt you, what really disturbed me a little bit, I have to admit, and I think this is when VR to me really seem real more <laughs> than anything else. Now, I'm not really, uh, well, uh, back then, I remember I wasn't at all into horror stuff. I mean, I'm still not, but I, I wasn't really, I didn't even try horror things. Um, mm -hmm. Zombie shooters, I didn't try back then as well. It, I tried later. So Pixar was really the first time when I was like inside the body of a 60-year-old or however young the kid is supposed to be. I f it, it disturbed me. Like, I, that's <laughs> when I, <laughs> that's when I realized how powerful VR yeah, it is. really yeah. could be because when I'm playing Galactica Rangers or whatever other Tetris or whatever you don't really think about uh, what kind of character or how your surrounding affects your brain so much you just feel immersed you're playing you feel like you're in that world but you don't really question who you are in terms of your avatar mm -hmm. uh, but when no. I was playing Pixel Rip that's when I questioned I said am I really comfortable I mean that, that's that I, anyway, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, actually it's, funny it's that very interesting that because because uh, you you remember what I, I was saying a while ago that when we develop a game we want to push the boundaries of VR and right. when we develop a game we we choose one thing that we want that game to act, to excel at and to, to, to actually use the, the VR media uh, 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 as as greatly as possible and in case of Pixar Rift it's all about embodiment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about embodying a different character. So uh, the multi-layered gameplay, you know, focusing on focusing on the on the small screen in front of you because you're playing a video game. Uh, right. For example, in a in case of eighty nine, you're playing a Game Boy at school, but in Pixel Rip ninety five, you are we are playing in a living room, and you are focusing on, on the action that's happening inside the screen. And when something happens outside of the screen, so for example, your mom comes from the from the the, the door in the background and say, "Hey, it's David, I, I'm home." You actually believe that you're David. You actually believe that right. that's your mom. Yeah, it's clever. And if if at some point someone in the, in the actual real world touches you, you you actually <laughs> get a little bit, you know, you, you get scared because definitely you, you are so much focused on two layers of gameplay that you forget about the, the outside layer. 
Right. And actually, when I was playing Pixel Rip, uh, for uh, when we were still developing the game and testing, I remember that the the narrative designer she. I didn't know all the lines that mom was going to say on the phone because in the first level of the game you're playing here and your mom is like walking and, and talking on the phone with someone. And I was like testing the game and I didn't know all the possible phrases that the mom could say. Uh, and at some point she was talking to, to some, some friend about me and saying that I was uh, that I used to be the best. You know, she says that about David. She says, oh, okay, David... Oh, you know, he still pee, uh, pees his bed. And my reaction at the time was to be like, Mom! You know, <laughs> like my reaction, <laughs> I was really embarrassed. I was like, you can't tell the things from the people. And I actually, you know, like physically reacted like like I was embarrassed and, and kind of angry at her for, for right. saying that kind of things on the phone about me. And then I, I realized that she wasn't yeah, my actual mom and I should feel embarrassed. And I think that's the that this is something that Pixar uh, the series as a whole does very well. Um, this sounds like it was uh, a little bit special when it comes to uh, Pixar Rip. So it was brought in by someone else originally. Did, did, does Yuki have a similar story, or h how did the idea before you guys started on the project uh, come come to oh come God. come about? <laughs> Kako will probably be better at explaining this, but it's a long okay. story as well. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, at Arvori, we have a lot of talents of different backgrounds. And whenever we want to approach something, uh, we always uh, we, we do have an, uh, an openness to mm -hmm. propositions, um, either done by uh, I, an inception phase or uh, game jams, and I remember when I—I I, I think it was previously a, a couple of months before I, 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 I was hired. Pedro uh, was working at uh, a prototype. Um, I believe it—it uh, it was the first time I already approached it, um, what would be later than um, uh, than later uh, uh, Yuki. It, um, at this point, uh, we had this LBE store called Voyager, and we wanted to prototype uh, a game to a uh, 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 game inside because uh, we, we had like a lot of other uh, games that could be played there, and we wanted to have one Arvory title uh, there. So, um, at at this point, um, we chose Yuki. Um, to be the game. So we spent uh, 2019 working on this LB version of Yuki, uh, which wow. had only the only the bullet hell aspect of it. It was just a straightforward bullet hell. It had Your character all the was elements. A spaceship. Yeah, it was a, uh, <laughs> it, it was the same game, but uh, in a different package. Right. And um, at one point, um, we decided, what if we, we do a, a home version of Yuki? So I started dra the first draft what, of what Yuki could be mm -hmm. uh, with more levels. Uh, I really wanted to change from a spaceship to a, an actual, uh, an actual like, uh, hero in your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, because of affinity, uh, uh, a, spaceship, a spaceship does not have a face that you can relate to. And I really wanted to bring this, okay, I'm holding a, 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 an actual figure, a real toy. Because even in the LB version, the core fantasy of being a kid playing with a toy was already there. So there right. was a lot of things that we have today that we started developing there. Um, it was uh, about early last year, I think it was February, that we decided, okay, let's do the home version. And we felt that to be, to, to be um, a proper game, um, considering um, retention, replayability, mm -hmm. uh, we brought the roguelike aspect to it. 
always on the what if what if we throw like some roguelike spice on it and it was a bold move i say uh but it worked out, it worked out. We, we had a lot of, a lot of testing uh, back then with the, mm -hmm. the, the voyager stores so we knew how how the game worked and we just set sail and started working on the home version so at, at what point did the creative direction change and, and why did you guys change it? Because it looks very much like an anime kind of style now. So was it like that before? Yeah, it, it was. It, it was, always had that feeling of being, like I said, the core fantasy was there. The core fantasy right. is always a kid right. who loves the, uh, the anime called Yuki, which has the... the 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 our our space ranger hero so it was always there even on the in the what we call the legacy version mm -hmm. for us uh, on the lb version it was always there it was always meant to be an anime um, 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 approach to the all, uh, not only the environment mm -hmm. but uh, we we always we 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 had actually the same uh, uh, another room, but it was the same idea. We started in a room, we pick up the, pick up the game. I, I, I think on, on the legacy version, there was a, a TV in front of you with the anime. I can remember, but it was always there. Right. And how long it, did it, it take? Like, yes, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no you go ahead. Even, even, even when, when it was a spaceship, uh, Yuki was an anime character who was the pilot of that spaceship. Yeah. Right. If you if you if you pay attention in th there was a we did a like a small Easter egg on Pixel Rated 995 about oh, yeah. it. we included <laughs> some images of what Yuki was back then and if you yeah. if you look at the environment you'll see some like posters and box arts of uh, of a game called Yuki and right it's okay. a completely different character but mm -hmm. even back then uh, as Kato said it was very important that it was an universe of uh, an, a kid who loved an anime because. If you hold a, a character in your hand or a spaceship, mm -hmm. uh, it makes a lot of sense because in 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 the gameplay of for 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 the gameplay of Yuki to work, you have to forget about your real life body. You have to yeah. focus on your hand. Uh, so the so you're saying your body, right? So these uh, are, are these VR experiences targeted to a younger audience. What what was the target market in mind for them? Um, when we were doing the LB version, um, it was a lot. Uh, the game was a lot lighter than right. it is today. When when we when we implement decided to go with the roguelite aspect, uh, we raised the bar um, and said, "Okay, this is not um, for uh, casual players. Let's let's do it like a difficult difficult game." But there is this point that. You you reach when you're doing uh, uh, you're creating a game that you want to have um, um, more people experiencing it. Mm -hmm. So we balance it to be like a pick up and play game, easy to get into and have a, a steady difficult progression. So it is. At at certain point in the beginning of the of the home version, we already had like okay, this is going to be this is our this is our targets. There is a there is an approach to there is an, an opening. Uh, let, let me say that there is an opening for casual players, but it, it steadily goes grows uh, like uh, difficult more difficult right. to uh, more experienced players. Now, since you guys work for an agency. Uh, again, it's a little bit of a different mindset as an individual indie dev, let's say, which I think is fascinating to, to, to hear more of. Um, mm -hmm. Now, an agency has to survive even when, I mean, especially as you guys mentioned, they have like 30 or 40 uh, different people on the team, which is pretty incredible. Um, so they have to think of the bottom line. Now, do you feel that do you feel that pressure more um, than, let's say, perhaps an individual when you're working on these games to think? Do they do they g 
get you to think more about the bottom line and uh, monetization and all these kind of things? Or when you develop games for an agency, it's pretty much you, you just don't feel that kind of pressure. What, how, how, what, what kind of feeling is there in terms of the monetization part when you're developing a, a, an app uh, for an agency? There's always a pressure, of course. Um, we have to, uh, it, it's a growing market. Uh, it's, it's not as like other video games like mobile. Uh, but it's not a pressure that, will, that is crushing. Um, there's always the aspect that we have to think about the, 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 how, how the, the game will develop over the years. Um, but is monetization and, something that is from the start, that is put in the brief? Or is it something that you, well, in terms I, I, of how? As, a, as any other product, I think as any, any, any other product, if you don't have that mindset, why, why start? Right. Because a lot of indie devs don't necessarily think about it. That's the thing. They do it because yeah. uh, they see something, they love it, they think, oh, this would be awesome. Uh, you know, let's just see. And then, and then if it becomes something someday, then great. Um, so that's why it's interesting to talk in, with you guys because you're working for uh, an agency. So it might be a little bit of a different, uh, different mindset in terms of how you go about developing. So the first thing is that the actual app itself has to have some form of commercial value would that be correct yeah as i said uh, as as any other product you have to uh, think about the whole package it's it's not only about the i mean uh, there's always about the the product the the, the value of the entertainment of the actual product right the, the, uh, i i mean the value of the entertainment you want to bring so the the content the, the the that you want to people to experience there's right. always that this is this is always what we have uh, the most interested of but if it if this is the is not backed up by a business um, thinking um, um, at our model of of, of company mm -hmm. um, it has to it always has to drive. They always have to um, have both go together. Um, that's how I, I, I view uh, a product being made. But uh, your experiences don't seem to... Uh, I mean, the monetization doesn't seem to detract from the actual entertainment value of your gameplay. Like, for example, I don't see tons of power-ups that look like a Coca-Cola bottle, for example. Uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, if you're playing Pixar, you don't see tons of things starting to flash on the screen or whatever to say, hey, click here, you know, you can go and check out oh, the, no, 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 no. the Energizer yeah, because, game, a mini we, game we or whatever, that. right? I mean, uh, we avoid right. that, like, like vampires, like, avoid like right. darling. It, it still feels the like sun, you just... Whatever, whatever <laughs> vampires avoid. <laughs> It, right. it really depends of, of what your audience is because yeah. we want to, to make games for people who want to perceive uh, um, value in what we do. Uh, when, you, when you make, uh, 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 for example, a free-to-play game with uh, microtransactions, the objectives are, are very different. When you, mm -hmm. when you, uh, when you start a project... Uh, free to play project. You have this, this all this business part. We of course we also have the business part. It's very uh, the, the objectives are different. You uh, you want uh, the player to to be retained for months, and you want ads to appear. You want the player to, to see that many ads. You want the the revenue per user to be uh, this much, and you have that as a goal. And at Arvuri, we want to, for example. Uh, from the business side, we have to understand how long the, the, the game is going to be. We want to mm -hmm. understand how much will it cost? What is the target audience? Um, is that something that, that your company educates other people about? Or is it something you have to go and uh, learn for yourselves? Or, or generally people don't care about that kind of stuff. They just want to focus on uh, you know, doing the, the, the project. Um, this is something that you must educate yourself, especially if you are like in a in a in a business role, you know, in a company like that, because mm -hmm. 
of course, we have a, a big team, and maybe not everyone in the development team uh, has that that kind of, of education background. Yeah, but right. yeah, of, of that kind of background. But the 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 job of um, of a uh, for example a product owner or a, a, a mm -hmm. product management or product manager will be to convey to, to the to the whole team what is our what are mm -hmm. our business goals because as a designer you need to have those goals in mind uh, if you if if I'm going to think about the mechanics of the game mm -hmm. and bless you <laughs> thank you uh, if you if you're going to design the mechanics or the, of the game or if you're going to design the art of the game or if you're going to design the sound of the game Everyone, the team must be aligned towards what the goal of the game is. And sometimes, if, for example, if you're playing, if you're making a, a free-to-play game, maybe the mm -hmm. goal is to make the player uh, really want to come back many times and eventually buy something mm -hmm. uh, or see ads to, to keep playing, whatever. Um, but I think that's true in for for most most things. I mean, maybe you tell me if I'm wrong, but I I, I think that is probably as true when you're just an indie developer or just mm -hmm. someone making any form of content, uh, whether it's a game or a video or something. Uh, you, you, you just want, I mean, I think retention is something that's in our DNA a little bit because we want mm -hmm. people to consume what we're doing as much as they po possibly can. Mm -hmm. It's just that the way we go about it, I guess, changes over time. Like the retention span now uh, compared to, let's say, 20 years ago, oh, yeah. you know, now is 20 seconds. After 20 yeah. seconds, someone already yeah. knows whether they want to continue or not, or even less than that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the fault of, you know, Instagram or whatever, watching uh, TikTok, you know, like within two mm -hmm. seconds, you know, if you mm -hmm. want to continue. What? So. 20 years ago, it wasn't like that. It was our retention span. It was probably, I don't know, maybe half an hour, or maybe 20 minutes or something. So um, I guess it's just the way we, we go about it in terms of trying to um, re re retain someone. And then, like you said, uh, trying to, you know, like I play a lot of Assassin's Creed, for example. Well, well, it helps me to want to buy something so that I can actually progress in the game. Because if I don't, um, then I guess, or, or, you know. Or read the books, for example. Or, right, or read the books. The movie. If you right. expand the IP. Right, exactly. Uh, so for Yuki now, it has very much an anime kind of feel to it. It's, I mean, come on, Brazil. What comes to mind from a Western's point of view or an Asian's point of view, okay, for Brazil mainly is Pelé. <laughs> you know, football, you know. <laughs> How come there is no football experience from Brazil yet, since you guys are in VR. Um, but I mean, an, an anime just sounds so Japanese to us. Um, is there an anime culture in Brazil? Um, you know, how, how come you guys, how did you manage to develop this art direction or, or and product design based on this kind of, you know, theme? Well, again, it comes from the car fantasy. Uh, um, we don't set the, the game in any place. Um, I don't want to spoil um, um, the lore, but uh, it's not set in any place that we know of. Um, uh, but yeah, it comes from the core fantasy, like you like anime. And, and from the art interactive point of view uh, approach, our approach was we have to this is the first time the IP goes out and we had to deliver uh, uh, some relatable images to the, to people. Back when we did the legacy, there was some other weird stuff that we were planning, but for this first time we said, oh, let's go with the, the Japanese um, culture approach. As for Brazil, we have the largest Japanese uh, culture oh. uh, um, population outside Japan here right. in Sao Paulo, actually, and I'm married with a Japanese uh, woman ah. <laughs> also. So right. there's a lot of Japan here in Sao Paulo. Right. But yeah, the the the, the thing it was um, we wanted to approach this uh, not not because not only because of the core fantasy, but because of the aesthetics of the game. And what we could do uh, regarding uh, elements, mm -hmm. um, Yuki being a, a, a bullet hell, 
it's very hard when when you're inside the game when we were playing to to look at the environment um so we had to uh, have this approach of uh, um 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 assets that would tell a story on on the beats of the mm -hmm. game um and that you have to look and understand quickly all this environmental storytelling. For um, um, when we started working on on Yuki, I studied a lot of. Um, um, uh, 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 there's, there was this illustrator called Don Carson, mm -hmm. uh, Don Carson, and he he he's an illustrator that do theme park rides for for Disney. Right. Being a road like uh, uh, being a, a, a on rail, uh, bullets hell. Mm -hmm. I had to understand how to tell the story, like the revealing of stuff. So this is like, first I want this uh, assets to tell the story and I want to, people to re relate quickly with this. So that's why you see a big story and say, okay, this is what I'm going through. And you have all these images, this perceiving of the culture bring on. Right. How Order, many maps? Sorry, um, go ahead. No, no. Uh, go ahead. How, ma how many maps are there in... In Yuki at the moment. You mean uh, levels? You mean levels? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there are six six levels. Six, six levels, levels, okay. And how do the? Uh, it'd be great if you guys, because uh, I haven't been able to complete all the different levels. But if there is a way to, uh, you 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 go. You're going to do that someday. I, someday, I, yes. But I mean, yeah. Um, if there is a way to, because I was trying to find some material to see what the different levels. Like, are they all Japanese themed or uh, yes, do they, they are. change? Okay. Yes, they are. But there's a, a, a different approach to it. It's very on the surface, mm -hmm. but we have like this alien like approach um, to some, um, some enemies. It's okay. Like a mix, mix between between Japanese folklore and alien, right? The, yeah. Everything is is a, 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 an amalgamation of these two concepts. And from a product design, production design point of view, what was your main challenge for this kind of experience? Because it's very different to Pixel Ripped. Well, as a, I think the biggest challenge was to tell the story. It, we have a narrative that is very on the surface. Right. Uh, we we, we can as a bullet in in this bullet we, we can we cannot we could not go deeper, um, unless we use like cutscenes and and stuff like that. But we wanted to the player to be engaged. Um, it's it's a role a role light. So you uh, whenever you die, you go back. If you always have the same cutscene, it would like um, be detrimental to the, the the experience itself. So we right. decided to keep the, the 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 narrative at a surface level. So the biggest challenge was to tell the story um, amongst that many bullets um, to this, like I said, to these assets that that goes um, whenever. Um, whenever you have like some time to breathe, we we throw some we throw we throw at you some part of the, uh, a bit of the story. What kind of, kind of things do you guys do for testing? Who's involved in testing, and that kind of stuff? That's well, Kaku is looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you're the expert. <laughs> okay, so um, the thing is, uh, game design in general is a very uh, uncertain. Uh, art, let's say, uh, to to paraphrase a person who Kaku knows also. Uh, it's a very <laughs> you can you you actually even as as experienced as you, as you can be in game design, you can never predict exactly how the user is going to to react to your game. And uh, as I said before, your goal as a game designer is to to create a specific experience, a specific emotional reaction in that person. So, um, it's as a, you actually. I I, I, I firmly believe that you can't uh, you can't actually be doing design. You you are not designing something properly said if you are not uh, iterating on it and you are not uh, reacting to user feedback because design with without uh, uh, being 
you you always must be user oriented, right? If you're doing so the it, testing, a product, so the te so the testing will start in house first. You do something, then you pass it to someone else. They have a play around with it. But, yeah. but then what happens? Like, how do you, do you actually have to build a community of private testers who all have to sign NDAs or, uh, exactly. and then also you, that's what it is. right. Yeah. So yeah, it's basically, it's, as you said, uh, from the start, uh, we tend to, to, to start with more like intimate testing. So you're mm -hmm. still prototyping ideas and you're like, cool, uh, gathering, you know, close friends or other, uh, your colleagues from work to, to test that and see if that works as, as, and as the thing shapes up a little bit more, uh, you start to, to understand that, um, uh, okay. So this idea has a, you know, it has potential, it has a future as you develop it, you must start testing with your target audience. And for us in, especially in Brazil, it mm -hmm. was, this was something very curious because we started testing Yuki before uh, COVID, before the pandemic. Right. And we used it to test our games a lot uh, in our office. So we would uh, uh, send uh, forms around like uh, uh, Facebook and stuff uh, asking mm -hmm. for people to, to, to come and test the game. And I think... Something that actually that, that ended up happening is that we are making games for for a VR audience, and in Brazil there aren't many people who own VR devices at all. Right. So right. we we mostly had feedback from people who had never had a VR experience before, and right. there is that okay. VR effect when you put a, a VR headset on anyone who's doing it for the first time. It doesn't matter. You could have just like a, a cube spinning in front of the person. The person would be like, wow, this is amazing. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <is> so real. <laughs> and <laughs> That's so cool, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's, it's real. The, the, the VR effect of, of testing is, is very, it's something that you have to, to pay attention to. You, because if you're designing something to an audience that already owns other who owns a VR device, their reaction might be different from the people who never used it. Of course, we are also designing for people who never used it. Uh, mm -hmm. Many people will have Yuki as their first uh, first VR experience. And but, what, what made, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just uh, when when the pandemic started, we wouldn't be able anymore to to do testing in our office, right? So right. we had to to rely on other methods, and mm -hmm. we started actually doing tests uh, uh, through the internet. You know, we mm -hmm. sending to 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 people that we didn't know, and it was actually for us. Uh, it was very. It was a, a huge step forward in our testing process. Right. Because we could actually test with people who would, were part of the VR community and who were uh, VR players and knew other games that they could compare to and say, oh, okay, compared to this game, I feel this, or compared to that game, I feel that. And do you, wh why did you guys choose a Unity and not, let's say, Unreal or, or any other, other kind of mm -hmm. platform? Um, I think... The, I think it just happened that the first projects that we did were on Unity, and right. we created that uh, in 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 company know how of how to do to Unity games. We, um, as far as I know, it's not that we are uh, we want to 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 use only Unity. We could use other engines if that was. Um, uh, it, we we are open more, to experience simple, yeah. with other engines, but mm -hmm. uh, Unity kind of became a tool of choice inside the 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 inside Arvory. How how easy is it? How easy is it to scale a map with Unity? Because some of these maps, I mean, even even the first level is pretty. I mean, there's there's a lot of it. It feels very much in depth. I mean, there's a lot there. Uh, there's a lot of power ups. There's a lot of enemies. Um, there's a lot of 
uh, stuff coming towards you to try and bring you down. And then there's all the buildings. I mean, there's a lot going on, right? <laughs> um, so uh, Unity seems to do a really good job in terms of handling that that amount of data. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's very powerful. I think we uh, thinking of coming to think of it, uh, probably we started using Unity because uh, back then it was. It was one of the best platforms to export to, to many. It's if you're developing a multi-platform game, it's very use, very easy to you know. Okay, so this game we're going to export to to Oculus to Oculus and to Vive and for example, Pixel Ripped was a game that was already being developed in Unity and it's part 2D and part 3D. You know that there's the 3D environment, but there's also a 2D right. game going on and. And having a very versatile engine is very useful for that. I, I guess well, that's why Anna started developing Unity. Was was Pixel Ripped more challenging than Yuki, or did did Yuki end up being more challenging for for various different ways? Um, or they both it have their own. It depends on the aspect. It depends on the kind of challenge you are talking about. I think. Right. I think that there was a a, tech, a big technical challenge on Pixel Ripped because, especially because it's a two-layered game, and you have right. to to do a good design in the in the two D and in the three D part. And there's also like for for programmers, it's it's like a nightmare because there you have you have two D physics and two and three D physics going on the same game. You right. have to very, be very organized about your layers and your scene management and stuff. Uh, so I think Pixel Rip uh, is a game w that wouldn't be possible if you weren't very organized about how we uh, would create prefabs, how we would manage layers, how we would manage scenes. Uh, there's a lot going on. There's many control schemes. <laughs> you know, you have if you played Pixel Rip 995 from start to finish, you have like a 2D platforming dot. You have a Mario Kart. Uh, bike riding dot. You have a uh, dot that walks in the 3D living room. We have a 3D dot, a beat em up to dot. We have, uh, I, I probably even listed like half of them. You have right. like a spaceship level and uh, being able to, to uh, not make that become a, a huge spaghetti code is, is, was a challenge. And, Doing the game in one one year and a half was a, a huge a huge challenge considering Apple that has a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think right. that the, the uh, Yuki, uh, when it comes to technical challenges, uh, the the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that we are making a game with an amount of bullets that you can't see in any other Quest game. I, I can't think of any any uh, Oculus Quest game. There are other games that have like shooting up mechanics but i think shooty skies thousands. would be the uh, i think shooty skies would be, would be the, the only closest, one yeah yeah the closest yeah. one yeah the closest, yeah but if you if you if you watch videos of uh of the later later levels in yuki mm -hmm. like uh level starting from level three it gets pretty intense i think yeah, or even level one is already pretty intense <laughs> <laughs> From level, yeah. well, like it's more intense. Are you crazy? Are you serious? It does. It does. <laughs> oh man! All right, I'm trying I'll to. Tell, like, I'll tell you it. something. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I only managed to to get to the last boss, to the last last boss of you once. To be, to be is, once. is that because you were behind your Unity computer and then you press play and you went directly to the boss? <laughs> 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 no, okay. When I was when I was um, make, when I was balancing the boss, I had to 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 go against the boss many times, and I only actually got in a in a playing fair, completely fair, uh, with with starting gear of the game. I only got there once. <laughs> uh, I only beat her once, but um, the mo most pe most people of the team can can do that easily. I'm just I'm just. I'm still getting good at Yuki. <laughs> awesome. Okay, let me pause there very quickly. How easy is it, or you know, to to transform the Pixel Rip series and you know Yuki series uh, on various? You know, you got Steam, you got Facebook, you got different platforms that you're using. Yeah, later, later this year, we're going to release on PSVR also. Right. So, how much work is involved to 
So actually, let's just talk about Yuki only first. How much work is involved to, you know, have to think about these different platforms? What what are the kind of things that you change so so that it's adaptable to those platforms? Well, uh, I think I think I can answer uh, that uh, when you develop the game on on Unity, it's pretty easy to to export uh, to other to other platforms. The only thing that you have to, to do is while you're developing it, you have to always during the whole process test the game in all, in all platforms. So, so when you were developing Yuki, were you thinking about how to optimize it for uh, the Facebook Quest first? or So what I'm playing on Steam, because we don't have, a, uh, we, we don't have Facebook headsets here mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, how different would the experience be for Quest user compared to the experience I have with my HP Reverb G2 or my Pico Neo? It's uh, it's quite similar because um, for for PC for the, the the PC version for the mm -hmm. you know like uh, Steam VR Oculus Rift version, of course you have uh, a better resolution. Uh, uh, I think we have like upgraded uh, skybox textures and this kind of stuff, but mostly the game is is designed to to be optimized on Quest. I think I don't know if Kako can can yeah, uh, give more uh, details. Regard, but. Yeah, regarding Yuki, uh, we from the start we knew that we want to be uh, Quest Quest and and the Steam and PSVR PlayStation. So you. Uh, um, when you develop the product, you want to have like the, the same approach, the same um, perception in all of them. Not to have this, oh, this is better than this. So you have to think about the project itself uh, as a perception from the player. Um, don't have this but like difference from from each platform to uh, to other. So from the from the start. We, all, we always knew that we want to target these platforms and let's do the same approach. So mm -hmm. design-wise, you already think like let's do the, the product. This is the product. This is the, the how, how we're going to perceive it uh, game-wise, uh, art-wise, and narrative-wise, uh, everything. So it's generally, is that, okay, I, I can understand from an art direction point of view, uh, but for example, if you were to change... Uh, some I don't know the 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 clothes of the final of the bosses or or maybe add some different icons for the power up. So uh, in the PC version, it's a more detailed power up that looks different from the Quest version, but not just we in are, polygons. We're always that, testing. We're always testing. We test but for, no, for, for what, what I mean is, if you were to change even, let's say one character, like adding a, an extra character or removing a character from one platform to the other, does that also mean you'd have to host it on a different server or when you upload stuff for PC VR or for uh, Quest, is it always on the same server anyway? Or, I mean, I, personally, that's something I'd love to, to know more about. Uh, are you guys able to talk about those kind of things too? Well, that goes beyond my knowledge. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the thing is, uh, the thing is, uh, you you said you already you already uh, worked with Unity a little bit. Yes, yes, Did but you, not okay. host. I don't host my game yet. Okay, okay. I just. But the thing is, we we uh, we actually we don't host the game. You when mm -hmm. you develop the game, you will build it, and. Uh, you can build it to, to different platforms, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we don't. I don't think there are any changes that we actually have to to, to do in the game. We have like a, a single a single project. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are developing it also for PS4. So there are mm -hmm. a, a few differences that require we working on a different branch because we use uh, Git as a as a mm -hmm. uh, version uh, version yep. control. Uh, I forgot how to say that in English, but yeah. Your repo. Uh, repository. Yeah. So we yeah. use the we use the the uh, Git as a rep repository, but we we actually only have to develop one game and then build it to different platforms, and then you send the games to the to the stores. So, for example, Oculus has and they they have like a, a um, 
a developer a developer site where mm -hmm. you can, you can uh, upload your Oculus Quest build, your Oculus Rift build, and same thing for Steam, same, same mm -hmm. thing for for uh, PS4. Uh, Actually, I, I wanted to. Sorry, you're going go to ahead. send different files. You're going to send different right. files to them, but you are working on a, a single project all the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you you mentioned at, at some point what happens if you want to make a character that is exclusive to one platform. Right. Uh, there are many ways of doing that. You could, for example, use Git to to create a branch uh, that has that that character. Mm -hmm. um, if you are don't don't. Uh, because of course you don't want the file size to be huge. You don't want the the data of the character to to increase the file size of other platforms that don't have the character. So that will that will justify doing that in a, in a different branch of the project, for example. But uh, at the same time, if it's not a huge thing, you can in your single project say uh, th there are a few uh, specific like techniques that you can do, but you can. Uh, for example, uh, add a component to a thing and say, okay, if it's not this platform, just deactivate this thing or activate this thing. Um, we do we do that a lot. Um, so in terms of the headsets, now what are your favorite headsets to to test uh, to to test Yuki? Do you guys have a preference? Oh, like playing Quest. Yuki. Wait, which headset yeah, do you like, prefer I like using? The Quest. Yeah, I like the Quest. I have a Quest One and. Totally enjoy it. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, well, sorry, it's charging right now. <laughs> I can't put it here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm I'm using a Quest Two. It's by far my my favorite. Uh, yeah. My favorite VR. Sorry, VR headset. It, and, what about and, you, Lazarus? What do you have? What's your, what's your favorite? Uh, I have to say that at the moment my favorite is the HP Reverb G Two. Okay. Mm. And then I have the Pico Neo. Oh, it's you. Mm -hmm. Now, the only reason why I say that is because uh, I will be receiving the Pico Neo 3 soon. Okay. So it could become my first preferred headset because the IPD. I think that would be the only reason why I prefer mm. the Pico Neo at the moment is because the Neo 2, so the HP Reverb G2 is my favorite at the moment. It's because the Pico Neo 2, you can't adjust the IPD. Mm -hmm. So there are some issues with clarity for me. Um, but that's the only reason. Uh, otherwise, when I play things like um, uh, Racket NX, I definitely put the Pico Neo 2 on all the time. So I do go for it for certain VR experiences versus, versus other. The reason why the G2 is kind of my favorite headset uh, is specifically because of the graphics. It's just so powerful. Uh, and it's super light compared to the Pico. Even though the Pico is much lighter than or it feels to me than the previous quest that I had, which was the quest one. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried? Have you tried uh, Pixel Rift on the Pico New? We we released the, the 1995. No, I haven't tried it with the Pico New, but I did try it with the HP. For you guys, when it comes to PC VR, I think the the issue that um, I, I hear a lot about is the fact that. It's not so much the headset that people are having issues with. It's so much that there are so many drivers involved, uh, like NVIDIA drivers and AMD drivers and window drivers or Mac driver or whatever it might be. Um, is, is that the challenge for PC VR when you're trying to develop, um, if for example, uh, you know, the Pixel Rip or, or you know, other VR applications for you guys? Well, the market for... for, for um uh, for portable VR is huge right now. So, uh, of course, we we have been focusing a lot uh, with with Pixel Reaper 95 and with Yuki uh, first to to make sure that the game will work on these on these platforms. Uh, the line actually was uh, the, the which is another experience that we we published. It was made first. Ex Exclusively for festivals, so we pushed, uh, like we made it for PC VR, yeah. and we pushed the the graphics to it, to their limits, and it looks amazing. The team after that made a great job of making that same feeling work on on Oculus Quest. It looks yeah. amazing on Oculus Quest, but um, it's it's hard to to make a game that you know that 
very, very, very few people will be able to have access to it. I mean, the line was uh, amazing before it was on Oculus Quest, but I, I couldn't show to, to, to many people, you know. Uh, and uh, right. a, a gaming PC costs a lot. Uh, I think probably what we are going to, to see the most of, of, you know, like graphics power is going to, to come from Sony uh, in the next years because... Um, not many people can afford a, 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 a PC that runs well. And, and there's all, all, all the things that you said about drivers and stuff. Right. But I personally, yeah, I personally use Oculus Quest with the link, uh, Oculus Link perfectly. I use it a lot to, to play all my, all my PC games. Like, it's crazy. I right? understand I understand that there are many people who, who enjoy using, for example, full body tracking. Uh, right. Right. There are many things that you can do more easily with PC gaming, uh, like sorry, PC VR, PC than VR yeah. portable VR. But at least for me, uh, using the because I, I had a, a Rift CV one for a long, long time, right. And for me, uh, you know, the, the evolution from using Oculus Rift to uh, Oculus Quest without the sensors and uh, just using the the link cable. Uh, for me, it was life-changing. Uh, Pixel Rift was more of a sit-down kind of experience. And Yuki, so you had in mind, you wanted people to be able to stand up, move around to uh, to avoid all the different objects. Would, would that be correct? How important of a standing up was for, is for Yuki? I think the approach that we have on Yuki was when we chose to do a, a bullet help, uh, we wanted to uh, look for something that other bullets hell in flat games uh, wouldn't provide. And in VR, like I said, the player is part of your, your of the experience. So we chose uh, body movement and a spatial awareness as our weapon of choice. And you know that to to go further on the bullet tail experience. So, yeah, it it is intended to play uh, uh, standing up, but you can also play seated. It, 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 it amazes me when, um, when we released the game mm -hmm. and some people said, oh, this is a very relaxing game. I said, okay, this is a... This is, funny to like a it's true how can be relaxed yeah, <laughs> yeah but it can be like there's a uh, there's a very good video on youtube that but it tells uh, can be used like as a meditation uh, uh, oh wow course. okay I gotta yeah look for yeah that one. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's a, it's 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 a, it's a very interesting um mm. thing to to consider um but yeah it, you can you you enjoy uh, differently, if you played it uh, standing up, um, the reach that you have, um, the the the, the able to be able to duck uh, and see the things, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't mean that you won't have it um, if you're seated, but you have like you you have a different experience, um, the muscle memory you have to. Not that you have to rely on muscle memory, but uh, the body will, um, you have like a, 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 the skew progression through your muscle memory. I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, I sense. understand. I, I completely, it, do, it does make a lot of sense because at the end of the day, uh, any experience in VR is just like walking in real life. I mean, if you yeah. decide to, to put yourself in a wheelchair and wheelchair yourself around a road, you're going to have a very different experience if you're walking, standing up. So, um, you know, or, or sitting down to eat a piece of bread and cheese versus eating that piece of bread and cheese standing up is equally going to be a whole total different experience. So yeah. it, it, I think that's, that's what people don't really, who haven't tried VR, um, perhaps aren't aware of is that it yeah. really does throw you in that lifelike experience so if you're going to play yeah. yuki and you're sitting down it's going to be very different to yeah. playing standing up for sure it's as enjoyable as playing standing up but this is this is a different experience the thing is that at Arabori we we are very concerned about comfort 
um, I, uh, when when I started working on the line, mm -hmm. um, the developers uh, studied actually studied dance move with a dancer to know about the costs of uh, kneeling down, standing up. So we are very aware of how physically involved you can be. As I said, again, um, VR is very, you are committed. And many times when you play a game, um, let's say something falls on the ground, you, you instantly react to it. You, you, maybe you, you put your arm down to maybe grab it and catch it. Um, so in a bullet hell, there's a lot of things going on. And you, we balanced it to have like this, okay, now you're, it's very intense and now it's not. And you, we, mainly, we don't, we don't want to hurt anyone. Now you want to, we want you to duck, we want you to dodge, but we don't want you to, to, to hurt yourself. I played many games. I'm, I, I'm, I'm in my 40s. I know my limits. Um, and there are many games that push you too hard, especially because you're engaged, and you spend like the next two days like with a, 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 an arm, nice. like a sword arm. Um, but uh, we, in Yuki, um, we we uh, think of, uh, we thought of a lot about this: how committed uh, you and your body will be, and and and. and not only the body movements itself, but also the the, the locomotion and, and dizziness, yeah, because I there's mean, a I, lot of bullets. I, I think and one ex sorry. I think one example. Well, basically, uh, is like pistol whip. Pistol whip. People didn't really oh, think yeah. that at the beginning. Oh my god! Would, the first time uh, that I played pistol whip, I can. You're even done tell. for the whole week. You can't move. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy, and people didn't really expect that. You know, this you are there. You're like you're engaged, but you, you don't want to it's, stop. But then it's crazy. Later, oh no, you, you feel it. Yeah, you feel. Yeah, it. I remember there was a weekend that I bought the, the weekend <laughs> that I bought until you fall. It was the right. same weekend that I bought Swords of Gargantua. Oh, you, okay. you know this one? Yeah, all like swords and oh, it was <laughs> too, on Monday. I I couldn't lift my arm <laughs> because they're both amazing games. Right, and it requires a lot of you, so you have right. to think about it. Uh, whenever you go play VR, uh, you, whenever you're going to uh, make a, a game in VR, you have to mm -hmm. consider the player, all the players that are going to, right. to, to, to be enjoying your game. Does does the pace of the game uh, in Yuki uh, become faster and faster as you play? Because the pace is pretty relaxed, and you know you have time to look around and immerse yourself and things and but then you have 10,000 things coming at you so <laughs> you know the, the stress basically build, that's, yeah <laughs> that's filled up but I'm just wondering in terms of the actual velocity of the speed of, of the movements uh, does it does it get I mean you guys must have tested it like going really really fast what 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 is it what like do you mean fast fast well because you, you fast fast the rail no I think the real your movements because your, your movement because you're actually just floating right it doesn't yeah. feel like you're running or you're, you're going like a, oh, yeah. a big train right uh so what what made you decide to just have it in a very uh calm kind of kind of feel as opposed to moving faster or because you must have tested different speeds yeah we, we tested intensity and and how many bullets you can like have um on 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 the environment but the thing is, again, is how, how the instincts of the player uh, plays upon this, what's going on. Uh, again, we never wanted anyone to uh, hurt themselves playing, so we have to consider right. um, um, the reactions and how in, uh, it's the limits of the intensity and how enjoyable it can be. Like, again... Let's remind of the core fantasy. You have a, an action figure, and you have to move. It's not about doing this. Uh, Milka, oh my God! It's about doing like whoa, like the flow. We always had the flow in mind. If you if you listen to the music, 
mm-hmm. um, of Yuki, it always had this approach, okay, you, we want to tell a story to the music, but we also want you to um, be engaged and in the flow of, of the movements you have. So if you have like uh, faster bullets... I don't know if it's going to be a very enjoyable um, experience because you're mostly like trying to avoid everything and not shoot. You have to be able to dodge and aim and shoot, you know? So mm-hmm. that's the thing we want you to do. Like you do these movements and play with your toy. You okay, have this, just- this uh, thread and needle-like experience. Uh, that the the gameplay, of course, it gets very intense in terms of, of the how uh, dense with bullets mm-hmm. the, the 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 play area gets. Yeah. But we always try to to restrain it very close to the player, uh, so you don't have to like jump one meter to the f- yeah. to to your right or left to to dodge a bullet. It's always I, I like to imagine there's like a cage around the the player and that this. Volume is like our canvas for mm-hmm. for creating, you know, uh, planes, lines, and uh, planes, lines, and volumes of bullets mm-hmm. that come in different directions. So the player has to actually use all axes, you know, up, down, left, right, but also uh, to the front and 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 back to to you know maneuver uh, precisely through something that is very at the same time it is that intense. It's not like yeah, precisely like you were actually, uh, <laughs> you know. I think it's about the spatial awareness that we were talking mm-hmm. about. Like you have to understand what's happening around you, mm-hmm. and and react to and it. around Yuki. Yeah, and around Yuki. Yeah, right. But it, it, I think this is the point. It's about how dense. I think Pedro Pedro uses a very good word. How dense this the, this environment can be in front of you. Which can become react pretty dense. Yeah, it is. But I, I really, personally, I really like the the colors. I think, I think it's a very warm and very, you know, it's just very vibrant. I I, I like that aspect in terms of the yeah. everything from the buildings around uh, to the actual. Uh, missiles coming. I mean, I say missiles, but projectiles uh, coming towards you. Uh, and and the actual design of uh, the Yuki character. When when everybody asked me to think about what a uh, Yuki home version would be, um, I imagined uh, like the the campaign mode as you have it now, and several other ideas. Uh, and as of it right now, we are work- currently working uh, on an endless mode, uh, which will be released soon as a free update. Um, so, uh, as from the beginning, Yuki was meant to be ex- uh, uh, have expansions uh, in all aspects of it. I think it happened uh, when we brought the the roguelike aspect. So y- you could have like more blade wings, more power ups, more levels. Uh, Yuki is was um, con- uh, built uh, uh, um, upon this idea that. We could all, we can always expand whenever w- wherever we want to. For now, um, we're working on this endless mode, which is something uh, a bit different from from what you're used to. Um, well, you see. So and uh, what what about is multiplayer something that uh, would be brought into this kind of genre? Multiplayer, a, a bullet tail multiplayer. Well. Um, it's so a, you it's see two Yuki's. It, it's two Yuki's in the same idea, way. and <laughs> and it, it, you're not the first one that uh, brought this to us. Um, and as as I replied to to this person, we first wanted to make sure that one person person could like survive, <laughs> and 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 have the the core uh, game work, yeah. Um, so yeah, much player. Why not? But well, how, that how long? Be fun. Yeah, that, that, that would be that, very fun. I guess it's not something that we've seen in in this genre uh, in VR, but we see it in traditional 
yeah, mobile or or all 3D 3D mm. versions of this kind of uh, genre. But yeah. so, how long does it take to to develop like a new map? What was the process like uh, from start to finish to develop to develop a map? Are you able to uh, to talk about that a bit in terms of its production process? Yeah. Okay, um, um, we, we had this idea of how long Yukish could, could be. Um, I remember at first we had this idea of having 12 levels, 12 maps. But then you have to consider uh, the roguelike aspect and how, how far the, tw the, the last level would be. Um, so the the uh, the whole idea was to how many how how long would it take to to reach the the final level and how long each one um, would would have to have this experience of going and back and, and having the satisfaction of of coming to an end um, and uh, reach the final boss so um, I remember that. Art-wise, uh, I had all all mapped out already. I knew the the narrative, a visual narrative that I wanted, um, even when it was twelve levels. But yeah, I think I think that's that's the thing. Um, the the length of the game is not about how many maps you have, but as a roguelike, and I think Pedro can explain better than myself, but how, how the experience could be, like the frustration of never ha reaching the final level if it was too long, having too many maps. So the first thing is that basically the maps have to contribute to the story of the actual gameplay. And then in each map, you have to redesign not just the actual textures of the environment, but also create new characters or create new projectiles and, and all this kind of stuff as well. So if you reach the final level and you beat the final boss, I guess uh, you could do a reincarnation. <laughs> I mean, it has to make sense to the development of the of the story is basically what you're saying before you can actually go ahead and create those new levels. Is that correct? You mean... You, you mean for the future, new levels in the future? No, that means if you want to create new maps, new levels in, in, in the gameplay, it has to make sense from a story point of view, first of all. Well, that's the core fantasy. That's the core fantasy. You're, you're a kid playing uh, with your toy. There's nothing much deeper than that. Without without pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah, without telling... Any spoilers for the future? Think about the core fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then from a production because point. Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, it's, it's just because uh, uh, for, it's like Kako said that the, 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 the game was created to, to accommodate more, more content anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, we, could, we could easily make, make uh, we can talk too much about it, but. Uh, we could easily fit more levels uh, in the game uh, if we need to. Sure. And but what I was trying to, to get from you guys, because I, I know you can't divulge, uh, divulge uh, you know, uh, secret things, but uh, what, I was trying to, what I was trying to get from you is the actual production process. That means from the, um, not what's coming in the future, um, but mm -hmm. more about like, how do you go about designing from the head, the concept, to the actual final... I mean, uh, oh, okay, the, the, of, the of phases a level. of development. The yeah, the phase of, of development, development of, a, so of one level, to, not, yeah. not, not the whole thing, yeah. Well, in, in, in Yuka's case, you have to consider uh, the, the whole progression. It's not about one level. Right. Because as, as, a, as a roguelike, you have to think that you, the player will he mi the player might f uh, reach the final level, but it, it will lack the power to maybe beat the boss. So you have to consider not one level. You have to prototype the whole experience to understand where where the player might die and come back, and okay. how many 
times the player will die on the whole process. So you start off with drawings, storyboards, that kind of stuff? I think the level started to start with, with, with illustrations, didn't they, Kako? I'm trying to remember. It was a long time ago. <laughs> I remember we had like a, a level on a, a Lego. 100 I, years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean it. I mean when it. VR was we, first invented. We really had... Um, there was no, there was no, no, not much drawings. I can, right. Well, this is what I can show you. Like, let me get my my. For example, um, this is the level one. Wow. This is level one. How I thought the level one. Wow. The first. That's level. that's pretty awesome to see something like that. And this is how it always starts. But it always like starts at some ideas this is the second level right but for, for example it's it's more narratively um conceived this is the the experience of the second level cool there's no actual like game design um thoughts mm -hmm. but there's this experience of the the narrative we we are at this point when i when i came up with these drawings there was already a, a, a notion of of the balance, the the, the difficulty progression through the whole game. Mm -hmm. you, you see, because mm -hmm. it's not about Yuki is not about one map, one level. It's about the whole experience, how you get there, and how you go go back and go like this. So it it can it, we can do it, uh, some drawings like. For example, Pedro must have like a, a, a lot of patterns of of the bullets. For example, because you have to understand, like it's very visual. The, right. the, the, Let me the bullets. I, I, yeah. I think I have the. I think I have, I have something about you in my notebook. It's not as beautiful as Kaku because. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, those were very nice watercolors there. I mean, it looked like watercolor. But the thing uh, yeah, is, yeah, the, the, um, the, the, the team is always working together. So there's always the back and forth of drawings and ideas. Right. Um, it, it doesn't need to start as a drawing. Uh, if you have an idea, you, you, uh, like I said, I have a picture of the team working on a Lego. Like the, the whole idea of well, this, is, this is going to be an obstacle here. They actually uh, made this Lego level. Right. So it doesn't yeah. matter. It, it just like the 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 the, the thing is, you have to. The concepts must be like expressed in any way you can. So when you create the various different uh, maps at the beginning, as you were developing Yuki, uh, before you began to model all the various different prefabs to make them look like uh, what was beautifully drawn there in those sketches was everything just you know cubes and spheres grace cubes gray gray spheres and then the gray boxing start plain yeah plain walls and then and then is that how you start off in terms of the testing and the playability or did you guys just model everything beautifully and then no, put no, it no, in no, no, and no, no, no. there's always a, 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 a prototyping uh, a prototyping right yeah um uh, with Yuki, we did that when we we worked on the LBE version back in in, in, in 2019. 2019. Yeah, so uh, we had like this first very early versions of uh, uh, some some objects um, that had no 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 actually uh, no form. It was just objects, obstacles um, in. Any form, right? The, the important part was the scale, how big they right. were, and, right. and how would you move, not um, the art itself, the textures and stuff. But there's always the the idea of scale and how the bullets would work. Like like Pedro has, did you find your drawings, Pedro? No, I did not. But uh, mo most of them are not progression. Uh, based, I think the progression based ones I, I probably should not show because they are like some, <laughs> some scratched ideas that that uh, ended up not ending up in the game and could probably spoil things that we are doing in the future. Yeah, but yeah. Most things I have over here are more uh, specifically because I actually 
I wasn't uh, I wasn't very uh, in this start of the project of, of Yuki mm -hmm. Kako was the creative director from the start and he was very present. I I was more of a supporting uh, mm -hmm. role because I was working mostly on Pixel Rip ninety five when when Yuki's production started and only by like half of the development, halfway through the development, I got into the team to, especially to 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 make the 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 bullet hell, uh, to to make improvements on the the bullet hell part of the game. So most of my my drawings are about uh, like uh, oh sorry, this is, I think I think it's not going the. Uh, <laughs> let me let me just uh, how do I take out this, this how do you go out of the, the pub but ba basically <laughs> you you created patterns of the actual bullets is what you're saying yes, so yes. Uh, so depending on how they were instantiated within the game uh, then different patterns would uh, basically emerge uh, within those events yeah, triggered yeah. by whatever okay and this on, on your how my house looks like so <laughs> I think like most of my most of my drawings over here are wow cool um, like a, a little bit more on the right. Uh, That's really interesting. I mean, they, this is really what's interesting is to see those, those kind of you know, <laughs> uh, understanding the production process. I think yeah. it's something that a lot of people don't really understand. Good. They don't. For they sure. don't realize <laughs> yeah. uh, how much work yeah, on Yuki. The, when we started the home version, um, um, we the first thing we did was work on it on the tool on the tool that would allow game designers to make the formation of enemies and right. the bullet pattern, pattern, but patterns. We already have the level because of the legacy version, but we really wanted to, to nail the tool and, okay, what can we do um, to enhance the experience that we previously tested? Uh, so this was a major step for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Before even starting working on the game, on the home version, let's have a tool that will allow game designers to work better. Awesome. This is a, this is a thing to, to have in mind. Um, you have to understand um, whenever you go, uh, whenever you create something, uh, what, what do you need to reach, um, how, to reach the expression you want to 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 put forward uh, for us it was very important because the bullet hell is the core of the game if we didn't have this tool it, it would be a very a very hard a lot harder for us to to create yuki have you thought about or have you approached uh or perhaps it's not your role to do that it's someone else in your company but uh, have you guys thought about working with pico interactive who uh, published distribute the games in asia if um, I'm not sure. Okay. Really. Have you guys I, thought I about? Do, I do know that we we did we we did uh, uh, Pixel Ripper ninety five for yeah. Uh, we, it for was Pico. published for for Pico. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I'm I'm also like Akko, I'm not aware of how are the plans right now for for other products. Well, what about HTC? Because kind of, they released yeah. the Vive the Vive Focus for the enterprise market, and they do add casual games in there because the companies who buy them, uh, you know, want some. They don't just want the headsets to be used for whatever application. Sometimes they want the staff to just take a break and enjoy some VR games. Uh, so they also add a library, and I think also probably because they're building a headset for consumer in the future. I, I, so it's a good way for them to keep testing that. Uh, have you guys thought about developing stuff for HTC as well, or you're not you're not sure of that yet? You mean um, for Yuki or for any for other Yuki or stuff? yeah, whichever. I mean, I, I guess Yuki because it's it's your newest baby, but perhaps but for now we have plans for P for PlayStation for now. So for PlayStation is for now. Okay. Yeah. Is there yeah. anything else that you guys you know want to contribute or want to add to? Uh, today that perhaps I, I haven't asked you yet or you know, is there we anything must, you want to talk about? We must not forget to uh, call people to our Discord channel. All of the course. rest we covered. We covered the, the, the endless mode, we covered the 
um, the PS, PSVR. So we're done with that. We're good. We just we must not forget to invite people to our Discord. Uh, my last question is this, uh, which is basically, uh, I'm going to start with Keko. Keko, what is the three most important things, advice you can give anyone who's about to graduate or who's just graduated, let's say, and looking to get a job with Arvore, what are the kind of things, the three best advice you can give those guys that you, you want to see in a potential person or, or whatever, how they can go about uh, you know, getting into the industry and, and working with Avori. 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 Okay. Um, be passionate about VR. It's a, a different kind of media. It's a different kind of telling a story. Um, very, very um, different from what, whatever there's uh, out there. So first of all, no VR. Be, be passionate about VR. Um, be ready to make mistakes. Mistakes are good. Don't worry about making mistakes because whenever we start, we want to prove ourselves. Um, Fail is good, like the late Milton Glaser said, embrace failure. And third, this is difficult. I think this 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 too represents the most what 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 I believe. I think this will suffice if you don't if you don't mind because these are huge for me. Like be patient and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Okay, Pedro, your turn. Same question. Mm -hmm. Top three advice uh, for anyone who wants to get into Avery. I will. I will start off by copying, <laughs> copying <laughs> Kato's answer. Uh, so both things are definitely the top. Uh, I'm going to add that um, VR specifically is a very humane medium. Uh, it's very close to, to how humans perceive the world, how they interact with the world. And when making games in general, like game design is a very humane uh, craft, you know. Uh, but when you are uh, developing for VR, you have to uh, let go of some like game conventions and think more about uh, human perceptions, human feelings, uh, human interactions, and always understanding that you are developing for a human being. Um, it, I think this is this is something that's very valued. Uh, like, uh, be very user-oriented uh, in your way of designing, in your way of thinking about what you're producing, what you're creating. Um, I think, like, the most more technical, uh, standpoint, um, if you are, Arvory is a startup, as we said before, it's, uh, we have 40 people working in it. Uh, so we, for us, it's very good, at least in, in, in for as game designers, uh, I can say about game, game designs, maybe other areas are different, but when you are uh, looking for working on a startup, versatility is very, very important because you never know what the next project is going to be like. Uh, the team is probably not very big. If you're going to be the only game designer or one of the only two game designers in the team, you need to to understand as many topics as you you know have to understand a little bit of of uh, level design. So be into architecture, be into understanding space. You want you need to understand. Uh, you're probably going to to mechanics, so you need to understand how systems work. Um, you need to understand a little bit about storytelling. Uh, so pay attention to, to what people who understand a lot of storytelling are saying. Uh, try to have experiences of, of creating narratives. I think uh, at least in this startup environment, if you and if you want to, to, do, to do big things, you have to to try to have just a little bit of, of everything, 
and then choose that thing that you think you're good at, that thing that gives you passion, and try to, to be very good at it. You don't need to be very good at everything. You just need to have like a basic understanding of different subjects because they are going to become useful to you and you'll probably have to, to solve problems of all kinds of, of or origins and have to be ready to, for that. But I also don't like when everything is so, you know, like streamlined and everybody is always, I think there's a lot of advice in, in the industry about um, like, oh, try to find your flaws and your gaps and work on them to, 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 to get better. And of course you have to, 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 to have the minimum of everything, but I think it's also important to understand what you're good at and try to, like, if that's your passion, if you are a game designer, love level design, like, go for it. Even if you're going to be a generalist level game designer, you uh, find the thing that you, you really are good at and exploit that, you know, exploit the, 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 the fact that you can achieve, uh, achieve big things with that passion. Do you guys work 24-7? Is it like that in the in no, the no, games no, industry? Not at all. No, no, no. Not, not Arvori. Not not at all. Right. Arvori right. has a, 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 a policy that our work should be approached on a health helpful way. Right. No crunches. No overtime. No working on the weekends. Um, Yuki had a very smooth delivery. We had yeah, no crunches Yuki at all. It was very smooth from start yeah. to finish. The Q, QA, QA phase was very, very nice. Very no, no big problems. Uh, I think it's it's how you approach it. Like you, right. you, you plan the amount of work that you want to do. You okay? I want to reach here, so you plan. Because uh, Singapore but, isn't yes. like that. Singapore oh, is. I know, I know, but seven and, days and a week. Yeah, Yes, I know. 14 hour days is yeah, crazy I, I, here, you know. I, I've been, I've been a, a free, freelance um, artist all my life. No, but even non freelancers. I know, I know, I know. It's I know, expected I, here to do that. Yeah, it's well, this this is the thing. Yeah. Crazy. When 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 when, the, the, when society expects you to to be like that, that's that's a very toxic way to approach work. Right. I don't believe in that. Um, as I was saying, I, I, I spent most of my life being a freelance artist and I work at 24 seven, but I knew when to stop. Um, I knew I took when I was way younger, I knew I like, I went and I, I, I remember, um, not, um, sleeping for two nights on a row, uh, to deliver a job. Not anymore. I, I don't think it's worthy. We can't it, do that anymore. Yeah, no. I, I mean, even even if you can, even if it's you not can, healthy. Yeah, sure, of course. Is, it it will yeah. reflect on your job yeah. on, on your work. Yeah, you see uh, um, printed on your work those um, long hours without sleep. It will. It's going to be messy. It's go not going to be your best work. I'd rather you to like sleep earlier and wake up earlier and start then then go the whole night um and deliver and send like and fall into sleep it's not worthy 